Hey everybody and welcome back to the Draw Juice Universe. I am who I am. You are who you are. Who are you? Let me know in the chat. Let me know where you're from. Let me know what you're grateful for because I'm grateful for another week. Um, I'm grateful to be here, to talk to you, to connect, and to talk about art and life and anything else that you guys want to talk about. Ask your questions in the chat um, now and as we go along. And, jeez, uh, we got a good, good little show coming up tonight. Good little critique. We got some artwork to, to critique here, and um, see what we can get into. Hey, Mimika. Good morning. Good day. Good afternoon. Over there in Greece. Greece. Yes. David Stocko. Hey, good night from here. Okay, good night. Going to bed? Um, <laughs> Ravi. I cannot say your first name, Ravi. Malavika. Malavika, Ravi. I think so. Where are you from? Hey, Nick. And Maggie. Hey, what's happening? Yeah, grateful for God, family, and health. I'm grateful for those things too. Yes, especially the the Almighty One. Um, thankful for that. And uh, I do have a quote, but let me know in the chat what you guys are grateful for. And um, I'm going to throw up this quote right here. He who is not courageous enough to take risks will accomplish nothing. Ooh, I thought that was some intellectual, and I found out it was Muhammad Ali. You guys know who he is, the famous boxer. Yes, Muhammad Ali. So what do you guys think of that? I think that uh, this has some real wisdom here. It speaks to me. Because in my life, I've battled um, this exact thing, just taking risks, um, fear, right? Fear, failure, fear, whatever, you know, just kind of fear driving everything. And so it's been, you know, it's we all have things to battle. That's I think that's just our human condition. So I've battled that. And, you know, I always felt like um, I was, I had something to give, even if I didn't feel that way. I, ha I felt that <clears throat> I had things that I could accomplish. <clears throat> so you might feel a level of fear, or you might feel that you're not worth it somehow, or you can't do it. But there's, there's probably something in you too that where you feel that you know, you don't feel it, but you know you have something to offer, you have something to give, you have things you want to accomplish, you have goals and things that you want to strive for. I would bet you have that mixed in there too. And I would tell you to, to favor, to favor that, to talk to that, let that speak, speak to it, speak encouragingly to it. Um, Cause it needs encouragement. It's like a little flower that has to grow, you know, and we cloud it out with, fear and doubt and negativity. And so just open that up. You're not the only one. And the only way to, to, to break through is to get with some people um, who can help you and encourage you, read books, learn how to encourage yourself, do all that, and then make mistakes, and then learn how to fail and love it. How's that? Learn how to fail and love it. And, um, uh, that's what um that's the ridiculousness of moving forward is learning how to fail and love it because that's truly the way to learn <clears throat> mm -hmm. so what else we got here we're going to do the continuation of our battling creativity, the battle with creativity that we've been doing this series. 
So I'm going to jump into that. Let me check the chat real quick. Yeah, Mamika's grateful for this opportunity. Yeah. Nick says we need to take a risk. Nick, I know you got some things you want to accomplish out there. You got to take some risk, brother. Um, failing forward, David said. Yes, David. Failing forward. That's how we walk. We're falling forward, and it's a controlled fall. And we just step out. Each step we take forward, we, we save ourselves, stop ourselves from falling flat on our face. That's interesting. So I think here we're going to talk about design, the design battle. And last time, let me just go back. We talked about gesture, right? And gesture was this lifeline. It's the flow. It's the weight, balance, and proportion. It's the rhythm, right? It's that fluid sense that the figure has. And how I like to draw, how I learned to draw, is you find the action first because that, that gives it that sense of movement. It's the C curves, the S curves, straight lines, and then you build off of those. So <clears throat> let's move from there and go to uh, the silhouette. Now the silhouette is so important after the gesture, right? After the gesture, you're gonna start to build off that. But first 2D, the 2D shape, the 2D proportion, so the silhouette um, and proportion are the most important things when it comes to design. It's that that big shape, that general uh, read. And what's so important is that the silhouette contains the read. And the read is automatic. Okay. If you can get your drawings, your imagery clear enough so that it's automatic, that's what you what you ideally want, clear communication. You know, if you think about it like uh, a billboard, okay, and it's, you're going to the airport and it's a huge, huge billboard and it says San Francisco Airport, Delta United, Aer Lingus, whatever, and you have like two seconds, three seconds to read that. It's gotta be clear. So it is, right? White letters on a green background. It's not interesting. It's not art, but it's doing, it's serving a purpose, right? That purpose is to inform the traveler and help them get to the correct terminal. For us, we have a little bit more time, but the idea, the principle is the same, that we need to be clear in our design. So that means shapes, values, and composition before any details, before any structure, really. So, so many of us and artists coming up, they get that, uh, they miss that, and they go for details and texture and get seduced by that stuff, the muscles and the beauty and all that stuff. So let's not do that. Let's, um, let's get our things, our order, and so the action, and then there's this silhouette thing. So um, the silhouette contains the read, as I mentioned, that's really important because we need to know exactly what it is. If the viewer, well, if the viewer can't tell what it is, they're going to be bored. If they can tell exactly what it is, they're gonna be bored too, right? So if they can't tell what it is, they might be confused and bored. Not good. If, if you spell it all out, they may be bored too. So you run a risk. You want a little bit of mystery, but you need it to be clear. Okay. So if the big shapes are working, the overall design will hold together. So if you have your drawing, step away from it, make it small, right? And so you can see the overall light, dark pattern and whether the silhouette is reading. And if you're working digitally, just make it really small in Photoshop. Um, does it read well from a distance? 
Does it have interesting cuts in and out, interesting straights versus curves? And does it vary from thick to thin? So th those are some things to think about. And that read that really is contained here is very, it's kind of emotional. The read has to hit you on some level, okay? So let's just look uh, here at some silhouettes. We got some props, we have some creatures, we have some characters. The If I cover the details on the left of the drawing and you just look at the silhouette, can you tell that this is a woman, right? And so much that negative space in between, right? the background, the figure ground relationship, that the way that the figure cuts out from the background is really important and crucial, right? With this uh, knife here, it doesn't matter the details, the materials, the reflection. What matters is this black silhouette. It's really kind of designing from the outside in, as they call it. And that is a concept art kind of principle where you work fast and you get you get the silhouette down in one value. Super technique, you should try it. Uh, here, the profile of this guy is an instant read. If I cover this, his face up, you can tell right away that this is a head in profile. And then again, this character here. So that's that's the silhouette uh, and proportion. So especially down here with caricatures, you've got a big wide head, a really skinny neck, and a medium shoulder area. So you go from big to small to medium. So the proportion, big, skinny, big again, playing around with that in just sort of the rules the rules of three, right? Rules of three seems to work in composition, in color, in all kinds of things. So whether you group things together, um, one is better than two, three is better than two, five is better than four. So the rule of odds or the rules of three. So let me know in the chat if that makes sense. You guys with me here? Um, when I kind of learned about the shape silhouette playing with that, right? Cause it's, it's like a dis an element of design is, you know, line and then shape and then value and then form. So line and shape are really the fundamentals. So if you can get your shapes down, like massing in tone that looks like something like you cut it out of construction paper with scissors that's really good that's better than a bunch of anatomy and a bunch of details so trust me on that um and once you kind of realize the power of that then you can take this silhouette and infuse detail into it at different levels so you get a different read i could put all the detail in the face a little bit less in the torso and then a little bit less down in the hips. So I have a one, two, three read. So again, we have the rules of three, all right? So just um, think about that, entertain that. So let's, uh, let's go on here to, <clears throat> to the crit. And where is it? It's here, right here. Okay. It does make sense. Thank you, Nick. David, yes, Malavika, I think I'm saying your, your name correctly. She says, yes, so good. Um, so let's see here. This was a portrait from last week that we didn't have time for, so we're gonna jump into this one. <clears throat> Let me turn these off here. Okay, so this is, uh, really nice photo is got some shadows it's got some interesting shadows but it's mostly kind of a front 
the light is slightly camera left and coming from above because you can tell you've got this little butterfly loop the shadow under the nose is called butterfly so it's called butterfly lighting and that's a, a photography thing illustrators usually don't know it but if you study a little bit of photography this is butterfly and it just helps if you're interested in creating lighting from your imagination or just identifying what it is you're seeing right once you name it you kind of own it so there's that little you know there's kind of a little butterfly down here and i don't know if i can really see the butterfly myself but just pretend that that's a butterfly okay so we don't have a lot of shadows to play with and that makes this difficult because it the separation of shapes comes from the local value right so that the hair is dark so that's one thing we can separate out or even we could go around down here and uh you know the red lips against the lighter pale skin that's local color separating that out the eyes are blue and eyebrows right so these are a little bit harder to deal with these kind of um, lighting scenarios so what do we do <clears throat> well we need to be able to show the box right so over here you know you can where there's no change in value here it's just all pretty flat and that's sort of the problem it's more of like a beauty shot where can you inject you know a corner into this thing that's what you need to do find places where you can inject inside corners to show dimension so right where this eyebrow right peaks up there there's a angle break there there's a kind of a, a, a vertice that is where there's a plane change you can use that eyebrow to do that okay it's really you know that's an easier place to do it it's good on women and and, and babies is finding because they're really curvy and there's not a lot of wrinkles finding <laughs> places to show off the box it's hard to do here in this mode there's just almost nothing there right and so i see you kind of beefed up the value here and it's not it's not there on her so i see you trying to figure out a solution to this and that's the right idea but a little bit out of value so it looks a little a little muddy Okay, so muddy, uh, we don't want. So we kind of don't want muddy if we can help it. And that's because the, the lights, you got too dark in your lights, right? Because this value here is this here. And this is like, nowhere near that this stuff here so i love i love the eyes i love the shape of the hair and the shape of the hair is so important to getting a likeness so you've got that going the shape of the hair and the shape of the face is really good on the jaw there's three parts to the jaw the front the transverse and then the ascending portion. If you can get that correct, you'll get yourself towards a likeness, right? So the shape of the jaw, I think you got the shape of the jaw. It's looking pretty good. <clears throat> so you got the hair, you know, the shape of the hair mass, the mask of face, and then the jaw. Let's go to the next level here. 
The eyes are pretty good. Mouth is a little bit small. And so I'm thinking your, your pencil looks like this. If we close up on it, it's got a nice dull tip. And that's going to give you a nice dull, <laughs> how can I do a dull, a dull line. And if you want to sharpen and crispen up that, it's going to be difficult. It's going to give you this kind of fuzzy edged thing. You want to sharpen your pencil. My students in class don't do that. Even though I tell them to on the first day of class. Here, I teach you how to sharpen your pencil. And it's really important. And they just don't do it halfway into the semester. It's still students not doing the basics and then expecting to do good drawings. And that's not a good strategy. So just uh, make sure you deal with your equipment, your paper, your pencils, and sharpen them up. Because that's going to, if you do, it's going to give you an advantage, a huge advantage, right? So if you have that, you know, really crisp tip, you're going to be able to turn this thing into not just one tool, but three tools in one, okay? So I bring that up because everything looks fuzzy. The edges look fuzzy. We Last week we covered this with Mimika's drawing, right? Mimika could give a lecture on this right now, right, Mimika? I hear her, she's saying, right. So what you want to do is, is you want a variety of edges. So let me just clear this away. So you want hard, soft, and lost basically okay so if you have a hard edge like this that's saying that the light is going quickly away or not the light but the form is going quickly away from the light get it there's an abrupt change abrupt change in the direction forming this crisp edge it's very geometric man-made um if you have, so let me just take it, and you have a soft edge, right? If we bevel that edge, it's firm, okay? We have hard, we have firm, that's like bone, okay? If bone and tendon is maybe good for this. And then if we further soften it, Right, it's just going to completely round it out. That says that the object is turning slowly away from the light. And so you get a soft round edge. So this you have to modify this a little bit. Um, so just put that, just memorize that. Think about it and then apply it because it's so simple. And that's the big key to a lot of this this stuff is knowing your edges so we have hard firm and soft and that's for you know like imagine an egg right you would use a soft edge on an egg <clears throat> but having hard and soft edges is huge so uh, if i came in here and i just lassoed some stuff and made some contrast between some of these things on the drawing Let's see if i can if i can do that here real quick the lasso is really a wonderful tool uh, for for getting shapes and then putting value inside so getting these value shapes and really quickly so that's going to give me a super crisp edge. And you'll, I noticed that there's a lot of um, 
crisp edges right underneath noses. Okay. And um, now I'm just going to blend. So you have a form and a cast shadow. We went over that last time too. The form and the cast shadow follow each other. So I'm just going to back off on that a little bit. Okay. So then where else can I find some crisp edges underneath <clears throat> the bottom lip? So there's the form shadow that's here. That's a little bit soft coming off the bottom of the lip. It doesn't jump out at you. But then here, that indentation between the bottom lip and the top of the chin, boom, you have an opportunity for the cast shadow. So you have a soft and hard edge. Okay. It looks a little <clears throat> overdone here, but I'm doing it digitally. And let's see the corners of the mouth. Right there. Make sure that's dark. That's like an occlusion shadow. The light will not escape from there. And you got that. That was good. So if you're careful about your shadows and your edges, you know, your shadow shapes and your edges, you're going to go take your drawing a lot further, a lot quicker. Okay, so here's another opportunity. You have the form shadow on the chin and the cast shadow onto the neck. All right. Let me fill it in with gradation here. Let's see what kind of gradation I can do. So I'm showing you some, some Photoshop stuff as we go to. So maybe something, something like that, because there's some bounce light in there. All right, so our neck is a cylinder, but it's darker. It's darker here and darker here and here but around here it's lighter. So there's light bouncing around. So that's gonna give it appearance and appearance of a cylinder if you put that knowledge into there. So I can darken this just a little bit here, give it a soft edge because it's in the shadows and that's gonna help that. Um, she has a crisp edge where, where else? right there on her shoulder there's a nice c curve right there it's a beautiful elegant curve so all i'm doing is just edge assessment i feel i need some music edge assessment music Okay, um, what else we got? Well, I want to deal with, I'm gonna dodge some of this stuff here. Get on that layer and then dodge the mid-tones. Okay, and take out some of that out of value stuff. So it needs, you know, it needs work to get it to where it should be. Um, let me check my messages for a second. Okay. So let me see if I can get there somewhat quickly. Just soften up some of this stuff because it's a ball. Okay. There's a highlight there.
soft edges, core shadow. That's there. Of course, I'd have to get in there and draw some of the the bounce light that's there on the the filtrum and on the wings of the nose. Right there's light bouncing around in there. That's going to help. Okay, then once we get to the eyes, that's where we really want to concentrate our construction money. Spend it there. Because you want to look in her eyes. You know, that's where usually the interest is. And so I'll use my dark accents for there, like in the pupils. The shadow from the upper lid onto the sclera. And a lot of times you can treat these lids like one, two, three, then into the tear duct. And the lower lid could be two, or it could be three as well. But there's a kind of a an asymmetry to it. It's not just two equal curves. So just try to remember that too. Um, what else? And then look at that shadow right there. There's the nice eyebrow and it's soft in here, but then boom, right there, there's a cast shadow into a form shadow. Don't want to miss that. You want to squeeze as much architecture as you can out of this stuff. So you need to look for the subtle hints everywhere you can't everywhere you can find it follow those rules right twin brother one following the other form cast form cast and we're just Step by step and usually a, a portrait will go through a period of looking ugly and it's the muddy middle right it's the valley of the uncanny uncanny valley where things just don't look real they look fake they look plastic they look terrible and you want to turn back and you think you suck and you're terrible and you're never going to make it right it happens to everybody i remember uh, working when I was working as a concept artist and I'd have a scene to do like a background or with a bunch of people in it and buildings and I was just mortified thinking oh my god the day's half over and this looks like crap you know and you're getting paid right this is your your job and you're thinking any minute that art director is going to come over your shoulder and just go um okay Let's uh, let's give this to somebody else. <laughs> that happens too, by the way. Um, but I found that if I persisted and I just kept going, I could pull it out. And so there was all the voices. You suck. You're no good. You're going to get fired. Um, but I didn't listen to those. They were there. They're there for you. Just don't listen to them. Take it from me. Persist. You can't blow it. You can't. What's the risk? You know, it's just your ego. Unless you're getting paid, your job's not on the line, you know, but you've got to take risks like Muhammad Ali said, and just risk screwing up, risk starting over as well. That is one thing that you have to have courage for is starting over if it's wrong. And you've screwed it up just too bad you know start over that works wonders <laughs> it really does and you can get sometimes it's better the second time because you've you've been through it already 
right? So I'm just, uh, you know, going through here, softening things, making things a little harder. You know, if you look at shadow of her eyelashes, right, on here to her cheek, get that. That's a hard edge. Let me get my value in here, you know. So, so interesting. I wonder if my zero, that's why. Okay. My my lasso had some feather on it. So I'm gonna do that again, just so you can see. That shadow goes over the top down the side and it's a cast shadow of the eyelashes above so that that can help a lot yeah so I'm getting my form shadow here And you see how it starts to have a little bit more punch to it, a little bit more intensity when I start to delineate hard and soft edges. And that's really all it is. So it's educating your eyes about these edges and then looking for the edges and then applying what you see to your drawing and learning how to handle your pencil so that it's going to make that edge, you know, on command when you need it. All right. And then this gets all kind of fuzzy over here. And there is a soft side edged, a soft edge side and a hard edged side to this cheek. That helps. Look at this metal right here, the metal earring. It's a crisp edge if I ever saw one. And yet you've got it soft and sort of blurry. And that's not gonna it's not gonna work for what you want, I think. So that would be the process to you know go through and do that edge thing, you know. I promise you it's going to make you surprised and happy at how effective and easy it is to do it. And uh, Maggie, let me know, not Maggie, Mamika, let me know in the chat if that helped you from last week. Talking about edges. Uh, <clears throat> so there. Really crisp edge on that hair as it frames the face. Notice how that hair highlight on the hair wraps around her skull, right? So it goes around like this, right? Wrapping around. Okay, so I'm going to go on to the next one. Okay, hmm, let's see. Um, lots of extreme, exaggerated mouth and eyes here. Very emotional. Um, <clears throat> yeah, these are, I'm not sure why he did this. He's probably a, a fan of Michael Phelps, right? And... Um, it looks good. I like it. A lot of nice details and stuff. Very good. Um, let's. I wanted to show you a couple of books. Let me see if I can put this on me here. Take a second and share with you a couple of books that I really like that I think will help 
you. One is from from Zhao Ming Wu, who is a master portrait artist. Let's see here. There's a little bit of a glare, but this book is a big picture book, and there's instructional stuff in here. So it's step by step, and there's an insert as well that he describes the process a little bit more in detail verbally how he does this what kind of charcoal he's using where he uses it and so on this is a great book uh you have you can order it online probably it's not something you can get in the usa and this book really opened my eyes to charcoal drawing and how to make my drawings look like paintings Another book is by Nathan Fowkes called How to Draw Portraits in Charcoal. And this is an awesome, awesome book with very um, painterly looking stuff, painterly looking charcoal, with dramatic lighting. And so, you know, we talked about big form modeling here. And so he's got that idea here. It's this idea, right? It's the generic head. It's just a primitive shape. So each of these is getting that big impression to read just the big form, no details, and then the secondary forms. And you can get amazing results that way. And so I definitely, you know, would recommend this book as well. Amazing stuff. Maybe you guys have these books. Yeah, if there's any books that you uh, you can recommend, put it in the chat. You know, hey Sam Pico, nice to see ya. Welcome. Hey Soap Soap Prince sixty nine. <laughs> right. Can we make a charcoal arts and digital? Can we make charcoal arts and digital? Yes, you can. Uh, I have brushes that you can get on my gum road um, that mimic charcoal. What else? Um, Procreate has some great brushes by Lane Brown. Lane Lane draws. I think his name's Lane Brown, and he's got these amazing brushes that work well on Procreate for charcoal. Um, <clears throat> what else? I'm just thinking. Art Rage is pretty good. Art Rage mimics traditional media. Excellent, excellent way. In Photoshop, you have to kind of fake it. You have to think differently because the brushes do look digital. Um, but you can get to a traditional result, whereas something like Art Rage will look exactly like oil paint or charcoal or watercolor once you put it down. So it's uh, it's really good that way. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to talk too much about this one. It's um, the lighting is, you know, kind of front on. And I'm not that, you know, to talk about expressions, that's a whole different lecture. And we could talk about the muscles and the different muscle groups that were um, cause, you know, you can, that cause frowning and smiling and all those different emotions. So I'm going to move on to this one here. This one looks really solid. Uh, this is Daryl. I like this one. The lighting, the proportion, the silhouette, very good. The value range, all the way through to the details and the surface textures. And love it. It looks nice. Um, if I would say anything about it, I'm just looking for if there is anything anything to say. For it, it's a pretty complete piece. Um, <clears throat> boom, boom. 
No, it's good. I like it. You could refine the way that the um, chin fits into the jaw, right? Because there's this fitting in here. It comes out and it goes back and then it fits into the jaw. So that's not something that's obvious unless you study the skull. Um, let's see if I can pull up my anatomy thing. So if we look at the skull, <clears throat> so we have the front, the transverse part of the jaw and the ascending part of the jaw. So if we tilt it, we can sort of see where it, where it fits in. We can see it has a top plane, a front plane, and then a side plane. So that, that's kind of helpful to know where it fits in. So if the front becomes a side somewhere in there, right? And so that's what we see on this, on the anatomy. And so we could, you know, you could kind of tighten that up a little bit and make sense of why that shadow is there. And so it's how things connect, right? It's not just the parts, but it's sort of the proportion of the parts, the, how the parts relate to each other and to the whole. And if you get your connections right, like this is a connection from the front part of the chin to the side part of the jaw. If it's not right, people notice it. They may not be a trained artist, but they notice stuff because they've been, our brains are shape recognition machines. So that will, you know, that will help that area. So usually I put things in flat and then I soften the edges where needed. Let's see, so, you know, something like that. Otherwise it's excellent. It's really, really well done. I think that little ear anatomy in there is a little bit. Could squeeze something in there. Mm. And here, right here where the transition from the hair to the forehead is soft. And it comes, that gradation comes down a little bit more. I'm showing off the box just a little bit more. There's a plain change there. And I'll soften the edge because it's a pretty, pretty woman. Not a lot of hard edges. Right, and I'll flip it. Whatever jumps out at me, then I'll fix it. Great way, because your eye will notice relationships, angles, verticals, horizontals, um, and, and it'll show off where things are wrong. So flip your drawings. Cool. Very nice. Great photo to work with as well. Um, let's move on to this one. Great job, Daryl. And then there's this one finally. So this one, we could take it a lot further because there's a little bit of something called like I call fear of the dark. Okay. So 
in this particular drawing, it seems like there's a hesitation to go dark, right? And so it causes kind of a an underexposed looking drawing. And so all of this um, mid-tone in the face is just kind of not there, right? So it doesn't have much punch and it doesn't have structure. One thing that does make it give it punch is this nice dark line around the contour. So it's popping the silhouette out from the background. And so that, that line, playing with the line quality is good. And then you've gone really nice with the eyes. You've rendered the eyes. They look beautiful. You know, your shapes and proportion look beautiful. Um, but it, you know, I'm not sure what style you might be going for or what. But let's say that we, you know, we have we have a dark. That's going to be our dark. And we have a white. We need something in the middle, like a mid-tone. What if we just put something like this in the middle? And then go one step lighter than that. So now we have four values, two in the dark, and then this is going to be white here, and two in the light. We can do a lot with that. So this, okay, could go a little bit darker. Now you see the way the light's coming from the bottom, it looks like, the front and the bottom slightly underneath. So this is getting hit and then it's going back. So this is front plane and then it goes back, right? So we can start to see where the plane changes are. So we want to express that. That's why I would, start, I would start sculpting out some value here. <laughs> Let me just do it with a flat brush. The worst, most artificial digital brush you've got is the round brush, the hard-edged round brush. But for this, we're just going to block things in. It's good. It's quick. It's down and dirty. Um, but anything that's turning away from the light, that's going to get this value in this world. Anything that's facing the light is going to get, but it's going to be lighter. And I'm going to put all those planes in a similar value. Same value, same plane, different value, different plane. Let's see here. Is there anything I can do to make my swimmer look better? Maggie, that was you. Uh, I think it was pretty good. It's tough to do those really expressive, exaggerated facial things. They really, you know, they're a lot of work and they look, um, you know, I don't do them too much like big smiling things, unless I'm doing caricatures or, you know, storyboards where I have to convey that. In a portrait, I'm not going to do that. Um, because it just, it looks kind of awkward, you know. Uh, but for sports stuff, you know, you may need like uh, these kind of expressive things like victory um, or, you know, the body exerting itself, the will, the body, and all the muscles and expressions come into play. And so it's not something I do too much. But like I, like I said, 
in storyboards, you have to do it because you're telling a story and it's part of a game or a movie. And it, and it just, it works better there, you know, but it just kind of as a single drawing, um, it's harder to pull that off and it's got to look really good. And yours looked really good. So I'm kind of doing my flat. Um, I guess it's like I'm just mapping in the darks, getting my dark shapes going. Making them wrap around over the surface. I'm using my kind of contour drawing, you could say. Expressing that chin. Right, so let's just say, you know, it's something getting there. Step by step. That ear is going to fall partly into the dark. And I'm just using, you know, a flat brush, a square brush like this can work really well too. <clears throat> and I like to work that way with watercolor and just putting down with the biggest brush I can for that area, sort of these value shapes. And they can be chunky at first, then you can modify them later. All right, so that's that's that. Let's go with the hair, and that's a dark shape. So again, I'm just going to block it in. Just fill it in. Oh, guys, I'm not showing this. Oh, nice job, Chris. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Sorry about that, guys. I was totally didn't transition from the book <laughs> to my Photoshop screen. Oh my, okay. It happens. Thanks you guys for letting me know. All right, so everywhere this thing turns away from that light, I'm gonna give it a darker tone. The hair is, is a local value is dark. So I'll just fill that in. And then his clothes here. Runs into his hand, it comes down here. Okay, so let's fill that in. Okay, so we're going with the flat and 2D, and then we're going to try and pull some architecture out of that. Can you guys see me and hear me okay? Let me know. All right, so now next step is going to be The smaller refining facets, this transitional areas, right? So I could go maybe there or maybe a transitional tone between these two, right? I need another value, maybe that, or maybe between these two. because it's going from the mid-tone. No, that's too light. Okay, well, it's it's that. That's pretty much the tone, the value of the paper. So 
something like this. It's very subtle. Right, so I'm creating a half tone step between this darker half tone and the highlight part. and just looking for the plane changes the wrinkles and stuff i don't care about that too much i don't care about the details i don't care about the shine i just care about expressing showing off the box showing off the structure that's all i gotta do Okay, and then I can go ahead and soften up some of the edges. Let's get that occlusion shadow in the nostril there. The wing of the nose meets the cheek. On the far side, right, there's going to be a modeling tone. For that nose so the ball the nose <clears throat> there's the highlight and then there's the half tone as it rolls away from the light and i'm just going to go through and just for the sake of time i'm going to soften edges you can do that with your finger you could do it with a paper stump You can do it by cross hatching very subtly with a gradation from one value to another. And most of the stuff in here when I squint is all soft edges. Let's see here. This one has a hard edge and then a soft edge behind it. Transition from the hair to that skin. You don't want to overuse this, right? Because then it starts to look, you lose structure when you overuse the smudge tool. So be kind of sparing about it. Because it can look too too airbrushy and then look plasticky and unreal. Let's see. It's coming along. Just back and forth. You keep developing it. <clears throat> I got my little five value thing there, so it's easy for me to pick values and not lose control. Don't want to lose control. So easy to do. So I can start introducing a little bit of the details in the skin. And this gets darker in here as that forehead goes back towards the hair. And I'll go a little bit darker, transitional tone to reach value of the dark hair. Go a little bit darker. Until I reach that common value. And then I can use, you know, this, I could use the idea of radial shading to 
go from the dark to the light. Okay. That's a way to transition that uh, concept from Ista Breck. She's a great teacher. And um, this idea where you're, you're, you've got these, if you think about the form as a topical, topological, geographical topological map, and they have these uh, radial groupings from, let's say, dark to light around mountains and flat plains, right? As the mountains go up, there's more of these circles like rings on a tree. So this sort of radial shading idea helps with your rendering. Okay, I'm gonna go a little bit darker here on that plane. Go a little bit darker in the lips. So you see how I'm kind of going through the drawing a couple of different times. Going from general to specific, going from flat to 3D, going from middle to dark and middle to light and letting it emerge. And always just going through and fixing things as, as they present themselves. And then assessing my edges. It's huge. Maybe I can, let's see. Okay, you can see the screen now. Thank you. Now I can maybe, you know, put in a little bit of details here and there, like the transition from the skin to the hair. And you can see that hair is going one way. And then there's some hair going against that this way, right? So just notice the patterns in how you transition from dark to light. And you can see some of, just analyze what's happening with that hair and see if you can understand it. Getting better. It was going through that that uncanny valley of the suck, right? <laughs> but you just got to keep with it, and it, it'll get better. Have confidence. Believe in yourself. Just talk to yourself. Tell yourself you're awesome. Get excited. I used to do that work all the time. I still do that. It's like I'm doing the best thing I've ever done. When people see it they're going to be amazed and i'm getting myself just the energy is building you know getting myself my head into the game you know psyching myself up and it helps me do better work i found and why not why not be excited about your your own work and just talk to yourself and encourage yourself You can always, you know, it's it's easy to be down on yourself and you can always be down on yourself if it sucks. You know, and after you're, you know, you've done the drawing, you're struggling, and if it really sucks, okay, it sucks. But the next time, start the process again and be encouraging and excited. And it's more fun that way, you know. It doesn't help anything to be, you know, bummed from the start. Right, just be excited at the opportunity that you get to draw, of what you can do. You know, um, I recommend that. All right, what are we doing here? We're keeping on going. We're pressing forward. We're gonna make that nose look. Uh, 3D.
Weird lighting, huh? It's a little bit, a little bit trippy. It's kind of that uh, almost it's eerie. It's not normal. So here I could put some little texture. I could use a little different brush, maybe. Might have to use a new hair. But these brushes you can get on my Gumroad. They're awesome. There's a ton of brushes there for painting, drawing. I'm not sure. I think the link is in the description for my YouTube videos. So you can follow that and find them. So let's see here. I'm going to go darker. And I can start to work. Now I can get into these details a little bit. And you can see on the on the men, the more wrinkles you do and the more hard edges, the more it's going to look masculine. So go ahead and have fun doing that. The pretty ladies and the young kids and babies don't, you know, not so much got to hold back <clears throat> on that. So as I, you know, go through the drawing several times, it's really a good strategy and a good workflow because I can control everything. And if at some stage I notice errors, which I always do, I can fix sooner uh, rather than later in the process because that's more painful. The sooner you can fix a spot and fix a mistake, the better. happening mm -hmm. right. check the chat <clears throat> Malavika says one day I feel like I'm good and the next I feel not at all good yeah so geez that's a tough one that's all artists have this problem and we need ways to deal with it <clears throat> absolutely um so i recommend not basing your self-esteem on your ability to draw <laughs> You know, it's kind of a trap. It, you know, it feels good when you're doing good, but it feels bad when you're not. So, um, you need a replacement thing for that, like to calibrate like who you are as a person, because you did a bad drawing, has no bearing or no, says nothing about your goodness of character, your moral standing, at all. There's not one shred of evidence that points in that direction, that you could weigh it on the, the scales of however you judge human beings and say, this person is a bad failure, <laughs> right? When I say it like that, doesn't it seem so obvious? But that's what we do. We just go down the tubes when it's bad. Don't do it. Find another way. Um, that's what you know, faith is for, that's what religion is for, is to have a realistic sense of when we're under that feeling of we're bad or condemned or something like that, that we, we can find an authority that says, hey, here's what is worth doing in life. Here's what I, I care about. And God doesn't, you know, I'm talking about God, he doesn't care about your good drawings or not. He doesn't care about that at all. So, just, you know, suggesting maybe meditating and praying and stopping and stopping that you know, 
bad feelings because they're just these feelings, right, that flood your limbic system and you don't have an answer, you don't have a counter to it. And I'm saying to you, develop a counter, an effective counter to the, the flood of emotions that start to take you downstream. And develop that just as much as and as hard as you develop your art, right? Because that can derail you, can kill a drawing just like that. You can be so discouraged. So, you know, you're not going to get away from discouragement or failed drawings and stuff. It's going to be a it's going to be a battle, but it can be so much more effectively dealt with. And because nobody teaches us this. You have to learn it on yourself. Learn it yourself. Take it from me. Mr. I felt bad about myself when I did bad drawings. Absolutely terrible. And ashamed. You know, if somebody saw a bad drawing I did, I'd be mortified. Well, that got in the way of my learning. Because if I can't do bad drawings, how the hell can I grow? So it really was counterproductive. And, you know, it's something that probably I will deal with in some level or another for my whole, you know, whole career. You know, it's not something that totally goes away. It's something that you get better at dealing with and saying, screw it. I don't care. I don't, you know, you know what really helped me with this? Let me see who's he's talking about art, not life. Yeah, I'm talking about art. That's what I'm talking about. Art is life. Art's my life. So art and life are the same thing for me. Um, but what helped me was I got a job doing karaoke. I was the sound guy in a karaoke show. And so there was a girl and she was the introducing people and talking and doing that. And I was just doing the sound. And then we sang, you know, I was, I'm a singer. So we would sing when nobody else was singing in the bar, right? You're in a public bar doing this. And so I was like really afraid to sing and screw up and all that stuff. And I would get up, pick a song that I knew. So I felt confident. And then as, few years went by, you know, I start to do songs I didn't know how to do. And what happened was I'd screw up really bad and nobody cared because everybody's in the bar having a good time. And so I would just laugh anyway. I noticed that I just laughed. I didn't rake myself over the coals. I laughed and I continued. I didn't die. And that helped me. It was like, oh, you can really screw up and you're not going to die. You're not a bad person. You know, my inner voice was saying, you're kind of a you suck. I mean, it was like, if you do something bad, you should be ashamed. I mean, bad drawing or bad singing. And so why, you know, so I thought that somehow. You know, other people, uh, I just played a gig a couple weekends ago. The guy I played with, he's, he's completely not like me. He's like Mr. Social, talking, advertising himself. You know, he just wants to be out there. He's hungry for it. He's not really held back. And he's psychologically sort of like that, you know, Mr. Gregarious. And I'm a little more um, introverted and whatever. Um, I'm an INFJ on the Myers-Briggs thing. So, you know, I have to, like, feel confident to get out there and take risks. Um, I'm not one to go out there and jump, you know what I mean? <laughs> but then I did when I moved, when I lived in China, I took so many risks and I was drawing in front of crowds of people because whenever I took out my sketchbook, people would crowd around. And so it was this event, you know, and at first I was really nervous and I would start to sweat. And all that but then i just didn't care it was like fun being with people and yeah i wanted to do a good drawing but it was like it was more fun just to have the experience 
and uh, not every drawing is going to be great anyway. And so we're getting into this drawing. David says, sometimes we're at our worst art critic and we, we say things to ourselves that we want to say to other people. Okay. You mean you say things to yourself that you you would say to other people? Or you say things to yourself that you would never say to somebody else. Is that what you mean? Because sometimes we're you know really hard on ourselves. We wouldn't talk that way to someone we loved. <laughs> and so another that's another thing is self care about yourself as if you're someone you need to take responsibility for right you're responsible for for your own growth and how would you treat someone who you had that relationship with that you were responsible for their their growth and their you know correcting them but also not crushing them well treat yourself like that you're worth that you know Consider yourself as someone with that level of import in your life. And then begin to parent yourself like that. So much of drawing is psychological. And so we need to be psychologically fortified, you know, to kind of get through it. I don't know if that makes sense. Jordan Peterson's book helped me a lot to deal with this aspect. Exactly. Yes. I quoted him last session was treat yourself. Don't compare yourself to compare yourself to who you were yesterday and not to who someone else is today. Compare yourself today to who you were yesterday, not to who someone else it is. Something like that. And that's a totally unfair way to compare ourselves. And yet that's what we do. I mean, that's what I did. It seems like natural. You just want to follow the leader, right? You want to be like the hero. Um, so in some ways that's natural and normal to do that. But I think we need wiser people to tell us how to do that so that it doesn't take us down, you know, and shipwreck us. So I'm glad, David, that you found that, that stuff, man. It's so important. So I'm just having fun. I'm getting lost in this in this drawing. Um, I'm going to do a couple more details here. There's so much. Gravity has a lot to do with aging. And... Uh, the loss of elasticity in skin, in the in the jowls, right? The bags under the eyes. And so thinking about the effects of gravity in aging someone, you know, adding more wrinkles, adding bags of skin, and kind of understanding how to do that. I want to soften up this edge here, not too much, but and this guy's tough. He's got wrinkles everywhere. Good practice. And he's got, if I squint, I see a whole lot of mid-tone here, right by his nose, upper lip. Sometimes I'll just make, to render, I'll just make these round circles and build them up. Really soft touch, you know, in certain areas. That's kind of what I'm doing here. 
makes a little bit of texture and but it gets a it gets it filled in into the right value So I think we're going to do a challenge next week and the challenge is going to be, I've been thinking about this and then I saw Mamika already jumping in and doing hands. We're going to do hands. We're going to do 200 hands in some, you know, something like 10 days. So it'll be like 20 hands per day. And how we teach it in the university is heads and hands. So they go together and I think that's what we're going to do next week. So I'll announce it, the details. Okay. So if you're not in the Facebook group, join the group and get involved and we do challenges and we did the hundred heads challenge and number of other challenges really fun stuff it's good stuff uh, i think the link for that is also in the description here in youtube um man drawing takes so long I'm just about, I think I'm going to wrap it up pretty soon here, guys. Any questions? John says, it took me two years to get back to drawing, but now I'm more confident with what I want to do, which is traditional portraits. Okay, cool. Yeah. Exciting stuff, man. I encourage you. I'm excited for you, what you can do. Anything else? Let me see. I'm in. He's in. Who's in? David's in. Okay, cool. David, you're in. Good stuff. I can't stop. I'm addicted. A little sense of the split of the lips there. Yeah, I worked on, uh, you know, doing tons of faces. I did all the characters like for the Godfather game over at EA. I did hundreds of characters and oil painting looking things in Photoshop. So I developed a technique to how to make things look traditional in Photoshop. Um, hundreds of characters and it was great training. And then I worked on the Lord of the Rings game and that was that was awesome, too. And so, let's see here. Oops. All right, folks, I think that's going to be it for me. Um, before you go, I have a question, John. What's going on? What is it?
What could it be? If you're there, go ahead and ask. Anything? Nope. What do I need to start digital art? Um, you need an iPad. Procreate. An Apple Pencil. Something like that. And that'll get you started. Or you can get a PC, Photoshop, and um, a Cintiq tablet, or an XP pen tablet. I have both. I have like a 21 inch um, Wacom tablet, and I have an XP pen graphics tablet and they both the xp pen is like way more affordable and it works really good so that's a really good alternative is the xp pen check it out um like not on pc yeah so ipad uh what should you work on you should get my course over at drawjuice.com that would take you through what to improve on and i also do one-on-one -on -one coaching too so if you want that mentorship you can get it over at drawjuice.com boot camp course and the mentorship course the boot camp is is just the lessons and then the mentorship is the lessons plus one-on-one uh, -on -one sessions with me um, that would really help you out. I'd recommend that. Uh, link is in the description for show. Yeah. Let's see, do I also have another advanced portrait course? Also, do you have another? Um, so that's what, no, that's what I have for now. And then I have, a one, I'm wanting to make uh, a more, course advanced course that goes really into rendering and finishing with pencil on tone paper so i'll be working on that at some point hopefully soon and that might fit your needs with that um I'm having trouble stopping. I just don't want to stop. I want to just go all night. <sighs> Fun. Okay, cool. You got my course. All right. Yeah. Thank you for, for getting that. Um, Malavika. Yeah. San Pico, you bet. All right, you guys. I'm going to take, at, take off end here i hope that was helpful it was a fun time david thanks for being here thanks everybody i was a little bit quiet this uh this time you know it's just kind of digging into a drawing and you know just kind of it's not too verbal it's just uh looking and seeing what's going on and asking myself is this a dark thing or a light thing is this a square thing or a round thing is it um, what's the edge quality and stuff like that. And so just sharpening your observation skills until you can make those relationships and translate those down onto a piece of paper or canvas. And uh, you can take some time, but I think anybody can draw. Right, these are trainable, learnable skills that we're doing. It's not magic. It's it's a process. All right. 
All right, everybody. Let me. Uh, I'll say bye here. There I am. Hey. Okay, guys. See you later. Lots of love. Be safe out there. We'll see you next week, or we'll see you in the Facebook group. Links in the description. And um, talk to you soon. Bye.